Mike, you're back. I am. Are you still shredded? <laughs> yeah, I guess. I mean, not as much as I was maybe before Christmas. <laughs> yes, you know, yes. That tends to do that to you. Did you uh, enjoy Mexico? I loved Mexico, man. I loved it. I absolutely, I mean, I had a, I, I like going on vacation. I like going tropical, beautiful places. I really do. I enjoy getting away. But I always, after five or six days, I'm like, okay, it's, it's time to go home. It's time to go back to real life. And yeah. this time I found myself really having like a crippling depression to go back to reality because oh man, it wasn't just that it was a beautiful place. We went to like a really small remote town in Mexico. So it was, it was not touristy. It wasn't a resort town. And um, on top of being able to get out in the ocean and, and you know, suntan in December, um, there was just like such a, such an emphasis on like family and uh, kind of a, it takes a tribe mentality where everyone knew everyone. And there was probably only 150 people in this entire town oh and God. everyone knew everyone, everyone knew the butcher, everyone knew the milkman, everyone knew the, the person who brings them their eggs and their fish. And it was just like, I started to realize that I have, I certainly enjoy living in Los Angeles and, I, and I'm, I'm from here. But I don't think the animal of Homo sapien is designed to be around 14 million other people. I don't think that that's how you're supposed to do it. I really don't. I think that like, we're fighting, we're, we're swimming upstream. Hmm. Um, how do you yeah. think we are supposed to do it? I really think that you're supposed to have like a, a network of people, 100 people that you really can rely on um, you, where you don't have to go out and find a babysitter and vet he or she to trust, you know, where it's like, yeah. no, you, you, I'll take care of your kids. You take care of mine. I got to go to work. I'm not going to worry about it. And, and I, I think that we're naturally social animals. And ironically, the more people we surround ourselves, the harder it is to be social. Mm, you know, I, I really do think like, you know, my friends and stuff that moved to Midwest or, certain towns in the South where the, the, the um, not only is the population much lower, but you have more land to yourself. And mm. I just think like, I think it's a little bit easier to make socializing and connection with other people, especially your fan, your friends and family, like the really important people. I think it's easier. Yeah. It's really hard, man. When, when you're living in a place like New York, Chicago, LA, it's really hard to kind of keep track on what everybody else is doing because you're all in this insane race and you're yeah. all like, everyone's late for everything. Everyone's pressed for time. Everyone, you know, and it's just, I don't I don't think that that's, that's really how it's supposed to go. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, that's one of the reasons why despite our desire to be on a beach somewhere, you know, in a warm climate 24 yeah. seven, we haven't left uh, Northern Virginia Washington DC area because we have our little group of people here that we can rely on, you know, all the time and they can rely on us. You know what I mean? And it's a support system that when you start to think about not having that, it like really starts to freak you out. You know what I mean? Right. Like, Oh my gosh, like I, I'm not gonna be able to see so-and-so and, -so and I, we can't just, you know, walk to this place or whatever, you know, as soon as we're living in a big city area, like LA, you know, we talked about moving out there and it's like, when you've grown up in this support system type of environment where you have everybody and it's just a small group of people, it's hard to get out of that. Um, and it's not, I don't want to get out of it. <laughs> like I just want to transplant it somewhere on a beach, but you know, it's, it's, I think you're spot on, man. I think that that is really how we're supposed to live. And I think that's also probably why mental health has taken a decline because you need that social structure that you can internally really rely on, you know, that support system for, like you said, the babysitter thing. I mean, that, you know, that thing of, of raising a child with a village and, and having people who you trust. I mean, that's such a massive deal, man. Right. Right. And, and uh, just to give you like a little insight into like what I'm talking about with that, with the town of Mexico, um, there were random strangers. Now at first, I honestly, like it was a, it was a problem. I was going, I was like, I thought I was gonna have to fight people. Because <laughs> random people I, I've never met in my entire life would just come up and just like kiss my daughter on the head. 
or like have no problem being like, oh, you know, cutie pie in Spanish, you come up and just like hug your dog. And you're, you're like, I, I do not know you. Do not touch my child. <laughs> We're not related. Right. I, do, I have no idea who you are. And you just touched yeah. my child. And I took a step back and thought about it. I was like, culturally, I'm the one who's distorted here. Yeah. Because they didn't do anything vulgar or inappropriate or obscene. They were just showing love and compassion. And that's sure. how they see it. it. It's perfectly fine to to show a child love, even though you don't know that child. I come from this, you know, this very guarded world of not only America, but like urban America. It, yeah. I have such a, a, a tightly knit kind of bubble around me that in um, personal space is, is so kind of distorted for me. You know, I... I I think that, and I and I'm a pretty positive, happy person that likes. I'm a I like people. Yeah. But I still come from a frame of mind where it's like, don't trust anyone until they prove me otherwise. And I right. think that in reality, we should probably be living in trust everybody unless they give you a glaring reason not to. You know? mm. Yeah. No, and they probably feel like, you know, if they don't show love and affection, they're doing something wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know? I, I must be looking like a real jerk. Yeah. I don't, I don't kiss that kid. I'm kid. an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's pretty, it, it, it is amazing. Um, we haven't had a chance to take our kids anywhere outside of the U.S. Um, mm. But the good news is we, my wife is Afghan and uh, her family is, you know, first generation Afghan. So okay. that, that uh affection and that uh personal space and like you know just the you know the warm fuzzy stuff is very normal for them right right? like everybody hugs and kisses and like touches each other and you sit on the couch and you know they got their arms around you and you're just like what is going on right (laughs) white boy who like grew up fighting anyone who would touch me you know like and and also like especially i i you know and i don't want to make this like a a, a chauvinistic thing but i think there is a, a glaring divide between american boys and american girls is that American boys, and I think you and I can both speak to that. It's like you're so it's hammered into you the idea of independence. Mm. It's, you know, like the you no, know, please go off away from your family. Do you? You need to create your own life. You need to be self sufficient. You need to be um, resilient to everything all on your own. That is it. It's yeah. like the old, you know, the John Wayne idea that is hammered into you for generations as like an American man. That's your duty. Go out, and make a living, and support your own family, mom and dad that we're we're just here to keep you alive for the first like five or ten years <laughs> and then <laughs> you're in the booth or you get in the boot you have to figure it out but in in other countries you know i've never been there but from what i understand from you know afghanistan like family's utterly crucial for survival Absolutely. the idea of having a tight-knit family is utterly crucial and uh, there's no and and even in in more what we would see is like cultures that mimic ours in a way places like um Italy and Ireland and uh, and Mexico for sure. You know, I've had the luxury of spending considerable amounts of time in, in the aforementioned places, and it's really not a big deal if you're a 35 year old dude and you live with your parents. Mm. It, it doesn't it doesn't say something about you like you're a loser. It's like no, I I love my mom and dad, and I right. work I work a mile away. Why would I? You know, this is awesome. Yeah. I I love my family and they love me, and it's a, and uh, and obviously there's a lot of advantage to this American ideal of being your own man and and absolute you know just thorough independence but you know you sacrifice something i I saw these kids uh holding hands with their parents in mexico and they're they'd be like 16. wow and i thought to myself i was like (laughs) can you imagine i told my wife i was like can you imagine if i was in high school and i showed up to like a football game holding hands with my dad and mom like it would the ridicule yeah. would never end. I mean, I mean, you know, it would most be just likely so- to not succeed. Mike Catherwood. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> right. But is it, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's kind of wrong. You know, I, I there's yeah. gotta be a middle ground. There's gotta be a middle ground. I think, I think there is a middle ground. Um, I see this in the Afghan culture of people who have, you know, first generation here who have kids who were born here, um, but they grow up here and they're very tight knit and tight and, you know, with the family and they live at home until they're ready to get married and have kids. Right. right. Uh, and even then when they do get married and have kids, they move, you know, a block away, uh, right. you know, or next, next neighborhood over. Uh, but they're always, family is always priority. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. Family is always first. And I think that that, you know, cause they, they have successful people in, inside the family, but they have that sense of 
it's not a safety net. It's just a foundation, right? It's like, Hey, this is what we want our, our kids to be around my parents. And you know, we want everybody to be together. I mean, it's great, man. Like family barbecues and like family dinners and like, dude, it's the best. Like I live for that. I didn't have that, you know, but my wife does. And I'm like, man, this is like, this is what I was missing, <laughs> you know? But then again, I'm like, well, I'm glad that I, you know, I had a, an upbringing where my dad was like, on your 18th birthday, you're going to pack your shit. <laughs> you're going to get, you're going to get on with your life. Right. Um, because it did push me to be successful. I think it's having two boys. I, you know, I, I think about that, you know, how am I gonna, how am I going to create boys who can be self-sufficient uh, and be an asset to society, but also understand the value of the people closest to you. You know, right. um, it's hard, man. Shit. <laughs> it's really hard. And I, it's really strange. I was talking to um, the, the chief of mental health at university of Southern California here. He, he's a, he has a child that's my daughter's age and they kind of run in the same circles. And we were talking at a little kid birthday party of the day. And he was saying that he, he wishes the pendulum could stop swinging so dramatically in opposite directions because kids nowadays, um, and when I say kids, I mean, college age, you know, they're, they're kids for you and I, but they're, they're young men and women. They're so left brain and incredibly intelligent. They're far more capable from an intellect standpoint than any other generation ever before. I mean, these kids are just firing on all cylinders, but they are far less capable of dealing with rejection, ridicule, mm. uh, uh, any form of adversity. And um, he said that uh, the uplifting part of it is that most of them, not all, but most, are at least able to acknowledge that mm. they're like I, I i'm a man child i'm 20 <laughs> years old and i got i got you know i got straight a's at a fine university and i'm going to get two degrees and everything by the time i'm i'm 22 but uh i can't i can't take care of myself you know and <sighs> so i wish there was some way like you said to kind of just meet in the middle and and you know i i'm, I'm optimistic I, I hate to be yeah. so cynical and think that no oh, we're fucked you yeah. know these kids are going to be pussies forever but no I don't think we're fucked. I think, I think you just have to manufacture challenges. You know, you, you have to create adversity in a way that, you know, you, you push them to the point where they can, they can look back and go, Oh man, I overcame something. And I, I, you know, I became a little bit more callous, a little, I, I, I adapted a little bit. I can now look back and have more self-belief yeah. in myself. And you have to create that shit. Like I had my, uh, my three-year-old, well, he's five now, but uh, when he was three, I had him run a Spartan race. <laughs> nice. and it was fucking awesome. Cause dude, yeah. He did not want to do it. And as soon as he got out there, hit, hit his first like mud hill and climbed over something and fell on his butt. And I'm thinking, oh, shit, he's going to start crying. Like, he's going to be pissed. He's had his biggest smile on his face and was like, let's go. Like, and I, right. he was like, and when he finished, the first thing he said was, let's do it again. And I was like, see, you have to, you know, it's crazy. But I look at it as like this. You could either fight it and be like, man, this society's so fucking crazy and like blah, blah, blah. But dude, let's just accept it and let's make the best of it and let's manufacture challenges because we do have it easier than you and I had it, right? In terms of technology and resources and whatnot. But we gotta just we gotta we gotta create this stuff uh, instead of dwelling on this whole like oh kids have it so easy, you know. But I'm like you know what I'm just gonna make challenges for them. I'm just gonna you know we're setting up a lemonade stand here as soon as it gets warm. Like we're doing stuff that you know old school baby. That's just you know that's the way it has to be. Yeah, and you, we have to, you know, we have to manufacture it because for for our children and for ourselves, because for better or for worse, we don't live in a world where a lion's going to come around the corner and eat us, you know, or there there's a there's the potential for another tribe to invade and, and take, you know, there was for the overwhelming majority of human history that was kind of the way you lived, and that fight or flight system was very naturally kicked yeah. in. Um, we, we don't, we, we don't have that, which is great in some regards, but we also kind of, we can't live without that. We have to kind of manufacture it. I, that's another reason. I just think, I think Spartan races is a perfect example, but also, um, combat sports, mm. um, you know, and, and that's another problem I have with, uh, with so many people taking their kids out of football. Oh yeah. Because American football I'll be the first to admit is wildly dangerous. And <laughs> this isn't open for debate anymore. They're showing this is a dangerous sport that can have cause a lot of damage. Yeah. I got to tell you, I played all sports and I played them all. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't exceptional, but I was a good athlete all my life. Yeah. Growing up. 
I without question took away more from football as far as things I could translate over into to life. Sure. I took more away from football than any other sport by far, by far. Mm. Um, but once you get out of high school, unless you're really gifted, you can't really play fucking tackle football anymore. <laughs> um, right. And so I've, you know, I've, I've really kind of sublimated that with, with like boxing and, and Muay Thai and jujitsu and things like that. Yeah, no, it's, it's the way of the, the man, you know, and, and, and the women too, like, not, yeah. this is just the way of the person adversity builds character. Um, I just watched the Aaron Hernandez <laughs> documentary. And it was all about, uh, I mean, it wasn't a laughing matter at all. But it just it reminded me of, uh, you know, the fact that he had tremendous ability and uh, had so much adversity uh, in football. Definitely, you know, he took it a little too far. I think his brain uh, had a little bit too much damage. So I think there is you know, hey, high school and middle school and elementary school flag football, like all those things are awesome. And hey, if you have the talent, you know, keep going, man. Awesome. Like I'll, I'll get my kids into it for sure. Um, knowing that, look, if you get hurt, like there are many other things you could do to get hurt. I had a concussion playing baseball, man. I got hit in the head with a 90 mile per hour fastball and my head couldn't, wouldn't stop ringing for like almost a week. Um, fun. Yeah, fun stuff. But I don't look back on it and go, damn, like, what was my parents thinking? I'm like, fuck, that was awesome. I wish I could do it again. You know? yeah. <laughs> I can take a time machine back now. Well, and like, there's, there's the, there's the physical pain, which, you know, people are the first to look at when it comes to football. But if you really look at the statistics, and I hate to, you know, some science geeky, but the most devastating long lasting injuries come from soccer, by far, mm. people are ganking their ankles, breaking their shin bones all the time in soccer. Yeah. And, you know, of course, you break your femur in football, you, a lot of you know, ACLs and things like that. But when it comes to just like physical damage, you know, football isn't necessarily any worse than any other mm. kind of really physical activity. Now, what you, I think, make up for is that there's, there's a thing that happens when you're freezing and it's Thursday night and you know you have a game the next day and your coach doesn't give a shit that you guys are all bone chillingly cold. If you're muddy, you're uncomfortable and everything about you is like, I hate this, mm -hmm. but you just figure out a way to keep going. And that, that, that was what I saw from football that, and also, and also like legitimate teamwork. Yeah. Um, basketball and, and baseball, um, obviously you're on a team. Sure. But you really, it's individual. Well, you know, you're a good athlete. You, you really yeah. don't rely on <laughs> your team. Not at in, all. If you're a baller in basketball, you're, you're going to ball. Like it doesn't, yeah. you know what I'm saying? What you win or lose is a, is a different thing, but you're going to, you're going to shine. If you're, if you're a great pitcher, it's great to have a nice battery. It's great to nice ha have, a, you know, a good defense behind you. It's great to have some sure. offensive support. But if you've got, if you've got hot shit, you're going to, you know, if your curveball throw up falls off the table, it falls off the table. Yep. Football, you need your team. And it doesn't matter if you're a short, fat guy. It doesn't matter if you're overweight and you don't even know you're going to make it through Hell Week. It doesn't matter if you're five foot five and 105 pounds. We could find a place for you and you can yeah. help. And we all have to look at each other and rely, know that we rely on each other. And that's like, you know, I, I think that's pretty crucial. Yeah. Now, football has like teams within teams. You know, you have your, your special teams, you have your scout team, you have your defense and offense and – you know, there's just so many levels to it that build uh, just, a, you know, a, I guess a clear path on how to become a better teammate, number one, uh, and the value of the guy next to you. Uh, but also, you know, you, you look to the left and the right, and you're like, I don't want to be the guy that, you know, gives up, throws in the towel. And uh, it's a good environment, you know what I mean? And, and environment's massive. So it's a good segue, though, into uh, <laughs> why I brought you on. We could talk about 10 other things, I'm sure. Uh, and 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 uh, avoid talking about fitness, which is awesome. Uh, I get people asking me though all the time, "How did Mike get so shredded?" And yeah. not just because you're in good shape. I mean, there's a million guys with abs out there, right? But because you're someone who also has other things going on, right? You're a full-time father, husband. You know, run businesses. You're in partnerships and other businesses. You stay very busy, and you still find time to take care of your body at a high level, right? Not just like, ah, you know, lose a few pounds, like you got an in incredible shape. So um, I, I wanted to bring you on because I had a chance to do some work with you. Um, and I, I preface this by saying, and I hope all coaches would say the same thing, but I never look at anybody I work with as my work. I look at it as like, hey, I gave you a little direction. I told you, hey, this is what I would do. 
and you go off and you do a hundred percent of the work. Right. right. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I wanted to talk about kind of like what, first of all, what got you to say, you know what, I want to get in great shape. Like, I, you know, I know you're a former athlete and stuff, but I, I want to talk about kind of your mental approach to that first. And then we can talk about some specifics around how you actually did it. Well, I mean, I, first to address what you were saying, like, I don't look at any of my clients as, as I did this work in reality. Yeah. I mean, the effort, the sweat, that kind of thing, the, the determination was on my end, but you and I both know that with, uh, with a coach and, um, and uh, a client relationship, you can put a tremendous amount of effort into misguided training and misguided nutrition and not get results. So sure. I think that your, your coaching and your guidance was, was vital and it shouldn't be overlooked. And I think, you know, I'm not just saying that to, to, <laughs> to kiss your ass or to promote, but sure. in reality, it's like I could have worked really, really hard in the wrong direction and it ain't going to help much, you know? Sure. So, so yes, I did put in the work, but I also was guided on the right path. It was, it was a, it was a, it was a, you know, kind of a symbiotic relationship. And, For uh, sure. No, that's a good point. And, you know, I think, uh, yeah, you're, you're kind of right. It's like momentum, you know, you know, momentum can be a great thing, can be a terrible thing. Um, yeah. And uh, a good coach will just give you the momentum in the right direction and say, Hey, you know, course, correct you, make sure you're not overthinking things give you the, the tools needed to get there. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the client's the one who climbs the mountain, right? It's like, mm -hmm. hey, here's, here's where you go. Here's the path. Here's the route to take. Here's what to do when you run into this issue. But ultimately, you're the one who has to put one foot in front of the other, right? Um, so talk to me about why, why did you want to get in great shape? What, what was the purpose? Well, I mean, it was kind of like, well, there's like multifaceted reasons. And for one, I, I wasn't in bad shape yeah, yeah. going in. So I think that, that that bears repeating, not because I want people to be like, well, yes, we, we acknowledge you have always stayed in relatively good shape. No, sure. I, want, I want to point that out because if you're 55 pounds overweight and you're getting started with, with you or with another coach, you can't really expect – you have the end result that I did in, in 12 weeks because sure. my training history was rather extensive. My, my knowledge of nutrition going in was extensive. So, you know, um, there was a lot of factors there. I, I didn't have all that much to, to go to get to where I wanted to be. And um, I, I had found myself like, I had gotten to the point where I had just gotten so neurotic about looking a certain way that it actually backfired and I ended up going, fuck it, and just eating whatever the fuck I wanted and training whenever I had the time. Mm. And after six months of that, like I said, still I'm having like a four pack, you know, and, and, sure. a, and, a, and a 300 pound bench press. So it wasn't like I was a, a, a sloth. Mm. I just said, this isn't me. This isn't how I feel comfortable. This isn't how I feel happy. And um, I'm going to do this not so that I can take my shirt off and have everybody go ooh ah, and not so that I can show up at the gym in a tank top and have all the other guys go, fuck that guy. Look at it. <laughs> this is not going to be my motivation. I'm going to do it because no one else is forcing me. No boss is saying I have a deadline. No, no judge is saying you do this or you go to jail. My parent, I'm not, 11 and my parents are forcing me to do something. I'm going to do this because I said so, and I'm going to go into the fire and I'm going to do it on purpose and I'm going to come out better and I'm going to feel great about myself. And I stopped, I completely stopped being in a competition with the other guy who's leaner than me and, or the other guy who's stronger than me. I stopped being in a competition with the other chicks that I wanted to impress. All I was, was I'm going to be better than I was yesterday. Mm. I'm good. This is my competition now is I'm in a competition with yesterday, Mike. And today Mike has to be a little better. doesn't have to be a lot better. Today has got to be a little better than yesterday. And that's all that matters. And I really dissected it from like a, the standpoint, you know, not to get corny, but I, from more from like a, like a 12 step prerogative. Yeah. Um, I'm using kind of like the things that I've gotten, not necessarily like book smart wise from recovery, but more from just experience. 
mm-hmm. in recovery. And it's, and it's, it, you know, uh, if I were to sit here and think about like, am I never going to have a drink again for the rest of my life? If I'm never going to do drugs again forever, it kind of gets daunting. Oh yeah. And I think about like, no, I'm not going to do drugs today. Mm. I can make that promise to myself and I'm going to do it. And I wake up tomorrow and I make the same promise. And next thing you know, um, you string together 18 years or whatever it may be. Yeah. And, and hopefully that could, that could be a lifetime. And, and the same, I didn't, I didn't go in 12 weeks, I'm going to have a six pack and I'm going to be 6% body fat. I, I got up and I said, what does Josiah have programmed for me today? I'm going to do it to a T the end. No, it's ends or butts, no excuses. This is what I'm doing today. Dude, that, that is that- so powerful, man. Like <clears throat> most people, you know, if you hear that, you kind of glance over it a little bit because it sounds like, yeah, okay, simple, whatever. But even just sitting here thinking, I'm thinking about it right now about like projects I have, right? <clears throat> and it's so easy to go, oh my God, this is a fucking elephant, right? That I have to eat. You know, this is a big deal. But if I really just go, well, I can't flash forward three weeks, right? I can't just go, okay, you know, let me flash to 12 weeks from now. I, all I have is this minute right now, this very second. What am I doing right now? Is it in line with the goals that I have? Mm-hmm. And it kind of gives you that rush, that like wave of like, ah, oh, okay, <laughs> I'm cool. I'm chilling, right? I'm good, man. I'm doing what I got to do right now. And I, I like, I, I need like whoever's listening to that, that has to be the mentality along with what you said about only worrying about yourself, man. It's so easy. And I do it all the time. I do it with business now, you know, where I see guys who are like, just crushing it, you know? And I'm like, Oh, what am I doing wrong? And the reality is I'm not doing anything wrong. Right. right? I just, I'm on my own path. I'm on my own journey. And there are probably people out there that look at me and go, Oh God, what am I doing wrong? And it's like, no, you're not doing anything wrong. You know, we're all just on this journey where it's just me versus me. I love that, man. That's huge. So, and, and it, it sounds, sometimes people can confuse that to sounding self-absorbed or arrogant. And the reality is, is like, no, no, no. If you really want to take care of yourself and be the best you can be, even if it includes being the best father, being the best husband, being the best coworker, you got to manage your internal stuff first. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not, it's not being selfish. It's, it's crucial. It's like um, when the plane's going down, they hammer into your head, make sure you put your oxygen mask on yourself first before you even worry about your kid. Because yeah. If in 20 seconds you can't breathe, you're of assistance to no one. Yes. Okay. So get that fucking thing on your mouth and then you can worry about handling your business because she just hit the fan and the first thing's first, get, get some oxygen going to you. And that, and you know, that applies to life first is people, I, I talked to so many dudes, mostly dudes, some, some girls, mostly dudes who are like, Hey, I, I have a serious drinking problem. Mm. What can I do? And blah, blah, blah. And I go, well, I'm not going to tell you what to do because there is no right or wrong answer. I'll tell you what ha- what worked for me. And hopefully that can, can be of assistance to you. Yeah. I'll say, uh, check into an inpatient facility immediately. If not today, by sun up tomorrow morning, you need to be in an inpatient facility. Stay there 28 days at the bare minimum. After that, get some type of aftercare where you're going to 90 meetings in 90 days. And 75% of dudes will write back, I ha- I'm a thriving attorney. I'm a real estate agent. I, I absolutely can't take that much time off work. I have three. I have two newborns. There's no possibility I can do. I go, okay. Do you want to be a good real estate agent, father, attorney? Um, because you're drinking a liter of whiskey a day mm. and you're saying that you can't sacrifice 30 days away from your job and your family in order to become the best father you can be, the, be, the best attorney you can be, but you're willing to continue going at this rate where you're definitely not happy and you're definitely not getting any satisfaction out of your life or your work or your family. Um, I think you're, I think you're looking at it in a distorted way, you know? Yeah. Big time. So, and, and, you know, I, I thought about it, the little things, the training wasn't so hard for me as far yeah. as like actual day in and day out. Let me get into the gym. Cause it's 45 minutes, 35 minutes, whatever you, if you're really focusing, hmm. if I needed to, if I knew I had a busy day, I'll wake up early. I'll get, you know, five in the morning, I'll get, get to the gym. The thing was, and it's the little details that everyone, everyone, myself included, so frequently goes, well, I don't really need to do that. I mean, <laughs> I'm dieting, 
I yeah. just lifted weights. I did supersets. It was hard. I be, a sweat pouring down my face. I don't need to get 10,000 steps in today. I right. Mean, that's, right, Rick? Yeah. And I was like, no, no, I really do. Even though I've worked all day and my wife and I are just going to sit down and do some Netflix. And it's the first chance we've had to see each other. I got to look at my wife and be like, I need 20 minutes to yes. go for a walk. So that when I return watching Netflix, you will be even better. Yeah, dude. I um, love that. I just read that in a book. Oh my God. Uh, the way of the superior man. That's what it's mm-hmm. called. I believe. The great Where, book. David. Data? Yes. David yes. Data. Yeah. He, he talks about when you have things, you know, you need to do and your spouse is asking for your time. Yeah. It's better to say, I love you. In order for me to be hundred percent present with you, I have to go do this because this is my mission right, right now to better myself so I can be there for you. Let me go do this for 15, 20 minutes, whatever. That way, when I come back, I'm all yours for an hour. Right. Right. Versus going, okay, fuck it. All right. I'll try to do the steps after or whatever. And then you're not even present in that, whatever this could be anything, but you're not present in that moment doing what you, you know, you could have done after you got done what you needed to do. It's so fucking huge. I see this with guys all the time who are like, yeah, but my wife and yeah, but my kids. And I'm like, dude, we all have the same 24 hours in a day. I know it's been beaten into your head that you've probably heard that a million times, but the truth of, the, of that is, is you have to really go, this isn't, this is vital. I have to dedicate this time. Even if it means waking up earlier, going to bed a little later, but I have to make it happen. And I have to be clear with the people that I love that I'm going to be so present with them because I'm knocking this out right now when I need to get it done, when I've committed to getting it done. Yeah. And, and, and you know, the way of this period, man, is a great, great kind of reference because you also have to do, and I, and I don't want to um, alienate any female listeners, but sure. there is a special, unique thing. There's special chunks of adversity that guys face that that women don't deal necessarily deal with and and vice versa there's a yes. lot that my wife i've seen my wife go i'm like oh, I'm so happy i don't have to deal with <laughs> um yeah. and, and um and uh in 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 an attempt to make the to create equality and and tolerance which is obviously a beautiful thing anybody who's in their right mind wants equality and tolerance i think we've gone a little too far or we've gotten confused into thinking oh men and women we're just the same Mm. No, no, no. There's no, a no. real male experience, just like there's a real female experience. And there's a real kind of, there's, I think, criteria of things guys need to continually do to be the best man that they can be. And a lot of it boils down to, and I, I can say this with a lot of confidence because I was that guy for so long. And mm. it was the number one reason my wife and I had a lot of problems earlier on in our marriage is that I, com- I confused being um i confused being passive about my needs and my wants with being giving with Mm. being um generous i thought i was being this this martyr by being like oh well i'll forego all my needs (laughs) so that i can make sure i spend a lot of time with my wife and a lot of time with my children because i don't need to go to the gym today i don't need to go spar today because I should spend that hour with my daughter uh, because I'm such a giving, generous person and everything is about everybody else and I'm not selfish. Mm. The reality was I was I was completely compromising the best me I could be. Yep. And then when I started really drawing a line in the sand, not being a prick about it, but really laying down the framework of what I need to be the best Mike, it was amazing how much better my relationship with my wife and my daughter were. It's crazy how that works, yeah. man. It's crazy. Yeah, I know. I, I'm, I think we've all been guilty of it because we, you know, especially if we're the people pleasing type, right? Where we're like, Hey, I just want, you know, I want them to be happy. Like I want to, I want to be like the guy who's like, you know, giving them my best, you know, you, you, you start to go, wait a second, you know, like I'm, I'm not even showing up. Like my energy sucks because I haven't been eating right. Cause I haven't prepped my food and I haven't been working out and you know, I'm pissed off. I want to hit something cause I haven't been sparring. Right. Yeah. Like, and then you go and you do, and you're like, what? Like, wait a second. Now I'm like, you know, getting compliments from my wife. Like, why are you so happy? And it's like, right. holy shit. You know, it's, but you have to experience it. Uh, and you have to be on both sides, I think, sometimes to, to realize, wow, how powerful it is to have, to have your cup filled, right? You got to have your cup filled if you want to 
others to drink. Right. Right. And, and don't, you know, I, it, that's another thing that's really easy to get. It took me years to get it. It's like, I would hear that from guys like David data and other people yeah. that I respected with that, that really analyzed masculine energy and things like that. And I confuse that to mean like, Oh yeah, I should go spend 70% of my monthly income <laughs> on a car payment because I want that, you know, I want a fucking, right. You know, I want a new, uh, Hellcat. You know, I want it. Therefore I deserve it. And I'm going to, and it's like, yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> it's about the important thing. It's about developing yourself spiritually and emotionally, making sure that, so then subsequently yes. you could be there for your family. A hundred percent, man. So with, with all the things you have going on, what were some of the things you did to, what were some of the nuts and bolts, right? How, how did you stay on top of your nutrition? How did you stay on top of your workout times? What were some of the things you did to balance everything? Well, I, I definitely think um, a big factor that uh, had, that really changed things for me, because like I said, I always was pretty consistent with training and eating. I never was a guy who just, it's since about 21 years old when I got clean, and I really got into bodybuilding and, and strength training and things like that. Um, I've always maintained a, a relatively healthy appearance and, and performance level. But if you kind of make things tangible, there's something about that that, that really keeps you, um, I think, mindful mm. is the best way to put it. Is that, yes, I would make sure I got a high protein diet. I would make sure I eat, eat a lot of uh, fiber. But if I'm constantly dialing in exactly how much protein I'm eating, it keeps me, it keeps me present. It keeps you attached to the food. So you don't just mindlessly go like, I'm hungry. I've eaten really good today. So I'm going to have a couple slices of pie before right. I go to bed. Or I'm starving. <laughs> I can't fall asleep. I'm going to go to the refrigerator and have something that you think you're like, well, Greek yogurt, it's, it's filled with protein. It's healthy. And then you eat the whole tub. You're not, you're not mindful. You're not present in what you're doing. And yeah. the same thing goes for training. So like a training log, a real accountable training log for sets and reps and exercises and what you're doing and how you're going to progressively overload and continue to grow. I thought really crucial, really helpful. Writing down what you're eating and diet, a food journal, and if you're listening to this and you're just kind of, you know, the weekend warrior who say, and it sounds preposterous yeah. to write down your calories and your intake and weigh your food, I get that. But it's not 1999 anymore when I tried to do my first bodybuilding show and I had to carry a fucking journal, like this little, like, a, like an encyclopedia of new yes. and look, go through the page and spaghetti squash. Uh, <laughs> ounces. Oh, okay. Then write it down in a notebook added up on a, com on a calculator. So my point being is yeah. like my fitness pal, that is something that you, I, you are fully responsible for is getting me to, cause I, I fooled around with other apps, but my fitness yeah. pal, this bad boy. It's amazing. Makes it so easy. The barcode nine times out of 10, you can oh, see yeah. the barcode. And barcode right makes it so easy, man. And, like uh, and if not, you just pop, pop it in six ounces filet. Boom. Yeah. You're good. Three ounces zucchini. Good. And, uh, you know, you do that three or four times a day and you've got your, you've got a realistic understanding of the food you're putting in your body. And not only does that keep your, obviously keeps your caloric intake regulated and your macros regulated, yep. but, it, but more importantly to me, it kept me, it kept me mindful of what yes. I'm doing at the moment. You know, I'm not just walking around the store going, man, nah, oh, oh, some of this shit thrown in the fucking, <laughs> oh, yeah, a little of that shit, that looks good. I'm like, no, you know. Me some turkey breast, you know. I go yeah. well, for this ten percent because I feel like it does a little bump in that fat does, you know, a little more caloric, but it makes me feel better. I remember from last time because I wrote it down, and I'm yeah. Everything kind of just becomes a little bit more attached to you as opposed to just living in the in the ethos, you know. Yeah, man. I, I tell this people all the time. Like, <clears throat> I don't look at tracking macros as something you always have to do for the rest of your life. Right. But it's kind of like riding your bike, right? It's like. I don't want to be the guy who doesn't know how to ride a bike. Like it's kind of silly, you know, like everybody kind of knows how to ride a bike. Why? Because you did it and you repeated it over and over again. until you got it. And the same is true with tracking calories. Once you've done it long enough, I would bet my house on the fact that I could look at a plate of food right now and be really close to knowing exactly how many calories and macros are in certainly, it. Certainly within like a hundred. Oh, absolutely. Or like a good, good meal, like a big meal, a sweet potato, chicken breast, whatever yes. it is. You just you get good at it, and and what that creates 
for me is, and this isn't, I'm not, I'm not saying this in a condescending fashion because I'm that guy too, mm. is you really don't realize how much you're eating. You know? <laughs> right. And especially, and, and it's not even just the, it's not even just the dude and gals who are, who are eating fast food all day and, and stuffing their fa face with Danish at work. I'm talking about the people who are actually consumed with looking good and feeling good. You're like, almond butter? It's healthy. <laughs> it's paleo, bro. I got the no sugar added almond butter. Yeah. I'm gonna have a couple spoonfuls, right? You you will so easily down 600 calories, like oh, no, without, without even hesitation, because you're just like, it's a couple spoonfuls, that's a no fucking problem. You know, it's and uh, so crazy, man. I, I actually I'm getting ready to make a TikTok this week about uh, <laughs> spoonfuls of peanut butter and how yeah. if you want to be in go into an instant depression, look up how much uh, a tablespoon of peanut butter really is, like how what it looks like, and you're like, oh my god, every time I thought I was taking a tablespoon, I was taking two and a half. Yep. <laughs> you're like, oh my god, it's no wonder I'm eating. It's like 50 grams of fat and one little sitting. You're like, whoa, no wonder I can't lose weight. It, Right. I, I look at it as too is for people who are out there who are frustrated, you know, who are like, I'm eating keto or I'm eating paleo or whatever. All good, right? I'm like, I'm never going to bash you for that. That's awesome. But if you're frustrated because you can't seem to get results, I would bet a lot of money on the fact that you're just eating too many calories, but Absolutely. you don't know it because you, you, you've never tracked it. So it's just for you to track, even just doing it one day. I have people who go, I'm not tracking calories. I'm not doing it. If you want to, if I'm going to work with you, we have to do something else. I'm like, cool. Let me make you a deal. Do it for one day, one day, yeah. and then when you're done, I'll never ask you to do it again. Because at least it'll illuminate to you what you're putting in your body. Yeah, and and they, and I get 99 of the time they track it for a day, and I get them email, Josiah, holy shit, <laughs> I'm eating 4,000 calories a day, and I'm like, thank you. Can you give me one second. I said, yeah, I yeah. Thank you. You're good. All right. All right. Yeah. So dude, it's just tracking calories. I, I don't track calories unless, okay. So I put it, I actually, so I do use tracking calories on a frequent basis because it is my job to be in shape. Right. Mm -hmm. And I use it though for stretches of time where I'm trying to dial things in for a project or something. Right. Uh, or if I'm preparing for an event and I want to make sure I'm getting enough calories because I, I actually go many, many times, days without eating enough. And it's like, okay, that's not cool either if I'm trying to perform well. Um, so I just, you know, I look at it as it's, it gives you awareness. And awareness, man, is fucking crazy effective. You know, I mean, self-awareness is one of the things that most people lack. Get aware of your calories. Like, just know what it is. And then that way, if you decide not to track, totally cool. But at least you have a general idea of like where you are. That way you're like, okay, cool. I know, now I know why I'm not losing weight or now I know where I need to be. And I'll just be around that amount without tracking most days. Totally fine. And, and you know, people think, look at it as like being overly neurotic and, and things. And, and the reality is, it's like, if you're, if you're going to overhaul your finances, hmm. would it be preposterous for you to keep a balance sheet of every expense and everything, and, and your income and your expenses? Yeah. No, it would be fucking crucial for Absolutely. you to really reset your financial world. So, you know, like, like you pointed out, I'm not saying track forever, but start it. Get, yeah. sit down, really want to make a difference in your, in your health and in your appearance. Um, do it, just bite the bullet and do it because you, it will pay off in great dividends. Absolutely, man. So before I, I wrap up, cause dude, I know your time is super valuable and I really appreciate you spending some time with me again, course, man. man. Um, what are some of the things, if you had to pick one or two really valuable tips for guys like yourself who have a family and, and, and moms too, like I, 
I, I, I hate when my show sounds like so male focused, but the reality is, you know, I have a lot of male listeners and we have some female listeners too, but what are some of the things that you would say are crucial besides what we've talked about already uh, for the guys out there who are like, Hey, I, I really want to make a change. I want 2020 and, and beyond, right? Not to sound cliche with the new year type of thing, but I really want to make this next decade, a, a, you know, a decade of health, a decade of being fit. What are some of the crucial things that you suggest they do? Big, here, here are the big number tips that I would give you. First and foremost, be committed. Make a decision and be committed. Now, what I mean by that is not obviously like commitment to showing up and go, doing your training. What I mean is, is that if you decide I need to lose 60 pounds, I'm going to do what I need to do to do that. I've got a great plan uh, constructed. I've got my diet in order. Let's go. Don't get... 11 days in and go, hmm, I've read a nice article about uh, the carnivore diet and, um, you know, body weight training, exclusive body weight training and isometrics. Well, I'm, I'm going to completely shift my training program and my diet. And is it? No, no, no. Hmm. Stick to it. Be committed. Find what you're, what you want. Find, be very specific about your goals. Find what gets you there and stick to it. Don't program shift. Don't diet shift. Don't get, don't get bogged down with fucking nonsense and, 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 and fatigue yourself with decisions that you don't need to be making. Mm. Find your program, stick to it. If your goal is, I'm, I want to bench press 300 pounds, go, you know, go to West side or 70 big, find a really, really talented, really accredited strength trainer, get the information and go, you know, and if, if your goal is, I, you know, I want to, do a CrossFit wad in this amount of time, do it. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't, yeah. don't, don't get three weeks in, start to get bored with it and then be like, well, no, actually I do want to buff up a little bit. So I'm going to go for hypertrophy. I'm going to be committed, be committed, yeah. be specific. Another thing I will definitely say is um, as much as it sucks, really, really commit to eating real whole foods. Mm. Shit that comes in packages, including protein bars and protein shakes. Yep. It just ain't the same. It just ain't the same as biting the bullet and washing off that fucking zucchini <laughs> and washing off the, you know, the spinach and grilling it up with your steak and your salmon or whatever. If you're vegan, getting actually taking the time to drain the fucking uh, you know, lentil Tofu or whatever. Yeah, the lentils and the and yeah. the right and you know, it's, it's just the same thing for vegans as it is for for anyone. You yeah. can so easily nowadays. It's not like it was nowadays. There's so many delicious, handy, kind of healthy things that you can just grab for protein bars, little keto cookies. If you're going keto, like get away from the fucking keto cookie. Make yourself some goddamn steak and quit yeah. being a bitch about it. That, that's <laughs> that's awesome. A, that's a because you know I listen. Now, am I saying you can't have a keto cookie? Am I saying you can't have a, a, a really good protein shake or something when you're on the run? Of course not. I'd much rather you kind of dial in your macros. You take a, a ready to drink protein shake with you and, and uh, some almonds and you're like, boom, I'm going. It's, it was either that or me having to figure it out when I get there. Mm. Yeah. If that's 20% of the 10% of the time, awesome. Sweet. But make a commitment to not rely on things that are created to supplement your diet, not be your diet. That is a, that is a, just do it. Get, you know, even if it's the night before I, nine times out of 10, I made my breakfast the night before I would boil a, a bunch of eggs and, you know, maybe have some, if it wasn't rice or um, oatmeal, some other like good starch, sweet potato, bake that shit the night before and, and wake up in the morning and just eat them cold. If I want to heat them up, I wouldn't, you know, I would, or, whatever, but I, it just made it so much easier to, like I said, make that commitment. Cause it, sometimes in the morning you're you got kids and you yeah. got to get to work and you're like, you're just scrambling to get it together. It's so much nicer to just pop that food in your mouth. So do, do the legwork to really construct your diet around food that comes from earth and not from a laboratory. Yeah. Um, and like I said, I just, to, to not to beat a dead horse, I'm not saying you got to be full paleo or anything like that. It's just, the nuts and bolts of your, of your diet should be real food. Absolutely, um, man. Yeah. Your appetite will be so much more under control too. It's crazy. That's it's shit in a package. They make it so that you want more. I mean, that's just the fucking reality. Even protein bars, man. You eat a protein bar. Like, is this a Snickers bar? Like, wait a second. You know, like 
I had an RTD right as we were getting ready to drink and I'm drinking this shit. Like this is better than chocolate milk. And it's like, hold on a second, you know, and it is like a 20% of the time deal is fine. Right. Like, you know, I'm that way, you know, 20% of the time I need a quick hit of protein or whatever, whatever. I'll grab a protein shake or a protein bar. Totally fine. But you know, nine times out of 10 or eight times out of 10, I am eating something that is killed, planted, grown in the earth, you know, whatever it's, it's natural food only because I know I'm going to feel more under control after I eat it. And I'm going to feel very satiated, right? Where I'm not going to be like, fuck, did I just eat 500 calories? It feels like I ate five, yeah. you know? Um, super crucial. As you're losing weight, trying to get, make this a lifestyle, make it easier on yourself, man. You know, it, you're, you're going to thank yourself a couple of weeks into it when you're eating healthy food. Um, dude, you have a fitness podcast coming up. I want to talk about that before. Yeah. I <clears throat> Mikey likes you. That's what it's called? Be- yeah. Oh yeah. Sick. <laughs> um, nice. so I, I, uh, the Twitter handle, the socials are already there. Mikey likes you one on tw- at Mikey likes you one on Twitter, but, uh, um, it's, it, you know, I'm excited about it. And, and I like, as you can tell from the first 20 minutes of this podcast, there's a whole lot more that goes into fitness than just your training and your nutri- nutrition. I mean, yeah. it, it's a really, if you're doing it right, and I say this as someone who's made all the mistakes and finally gotten to a point where I feel like I, I can confidently say, if you're doing it right, it's a spiritual endeavor. It's most definitely an emotional endeavor. Yeah. And, and your, your mental health and your emotional health um, are just as reliant on your physical health as they are on each other. Um, mm-hmm. and, and to think that you can be the best you that you can be by um, being not, non-active and being overweight it's just not reality. And it's not, you know, that's not, and it's not, there's, there should be no such thing as fat shaming or anything because it's not about the aesthetic. It's about the fact that if you, you only get one shot at life and to, to assume that you can tend to your intellect and meditate every day and have great relationships so that you've got the intellectual and the emotional taken care of and, and the spiritual seems to be on a good day and just let your fucking body go and think that your life is going to be as good as it can be. Is this not true? Mm. And, um, you know, you will see, I've gotten so much out of, out of training and eating right so much more than, um, just compliments on my apps. I mean, it really, that, that is, that is far, far down. Sure. Down the ladder. It's a, it, honestly, like, I, I really feel like it's a, it's a crucial key to, to being the best person that you can be. Um, and, and that's, that's going to be explored. You know, it's not it, obvious. It'll be training and, and nutrition heavy because people like it and people want that information. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's, it's a, com- a, a component, a large component is going to be, you know, the spiritual and the emotional aspect. And, and I, and I think I have a unique perspective uh, that I will, um, pepper in, in, in kind of the recovery aspect of it, because, um, it's preposterous how many people in this country are addicted. Yeah. That's what I'm alcohol. excited about, man. I, I, with your background, I'm like, I'm, I'm sure I have so much to learn from your show because, uh, we, we have a real addiction problem with food <laughs> and, and drugs and alcohol along with it. But you know, food is a fucking, it's a big player in the addiction game. It's a huge, it's a huge player. And, and um, it's all, it's not your fault. If you're listening to this and you go like, I have a real eating problem. It really isn't your fault. We yeah. science and, and industry has gotten to the point where they are so fucking sniper sharp at developing things that are just amusement parks for your, for your palate and um, metabolically just keep you constantly needing more and the cravings are out of control i mean we're just we're not fighting the same battle that you were fighting when it comes to staying in shape in 1950 we're absolutely not we are we are so behind the eight ball because um like i said the nutrition industry has just gotten so goddamn good they're trained killers man straight up they're straight up badasses when they're they're marketing geniuses they're palate uh geniuses they know more about your body and how to fuck with your desires and your cravings than you do and uh they are winning heavy like they're they're it's a landslide victory for them right now it's and, and don't look at it don't look at it as like a meathead thing like well yeah well i'm gonna say screw you to the industry and look at me i'm jack the lane and i'm so buff no think yeah. of it as like a think of it as like 
you know, kind of like a, a punk rock ethic where it's like, no, fuck you. I'm not going to allow <clears throat> yeah. you. I'm not going to allow you to disease me. I'm not going to allow you to taint me and make me toxic. I'm fighting back. This is, you know, the, 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 the idea of, you know, and I, I, I was guilty of this too. I associated lifting weights and eating my protein. That was like the jock meathead thing to do. Mm. In reality, in 2020, that's the most fucking punk rock against the grain, <laughs> nonconformist thing you can do. Honestly, yeah. it's like, no, I'm not going to allow Nabisco and Coca-Cola. I'm not, I'm not going to allow you to do it. I, I'm in charge and I'm fighting yeah. back, you know, and I really, really remember that. And it, may, it, it makes you feel really good about yourself. Hell yeah, dude. It gets me fired up just talking about it. Um, Mikey likes you. That's sweet, dude. I'm pumped yeah. about that. Uh, I when can't you... wait to have you on, man. I hope so. Oh, I'd love to, man. Uh, we're going to come out. Well, if we don't do it virtually, uh, I'll definitely do it when I'm out in uh, LA this year. Uh, we're planning a trip out there so we can meet a bunch of the amazing people like yourself who I've connected with uh, over the past few years and, um, you know, spend we'll come train at the Mecca. You got to do it. You got to come on my bucket the- list, man. I'll pay. I don't care how much I got to pay. I don't care if day pass is 500 bucks. I'm going in. <laughs> no, nah, man, it's, it's, it's expensive, but it ain't that expensive. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, no. I, I've, I've really gotten good at pinpointing when Arnold's there and when he's not. So I'll try my best to bring you in the, and don't, make sure that you careful, man. I'm getting a Woody just thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> He's a hero of mine, man. That's awesome. So anyway, now we'll definitely do the podcast, and um, I'll, I'll I'll be happy to support your show, dude. I, I love first of all, I love your story, but um, I, I just think there's certain people who just naturally I don't want to say naturally, but they just have a great way of just helping other people get it right, and yeah. that is so important, man. You told me talk about fighting the system. You need people. Because the fitness industry, industry is, is not far behind when it comes to train killers and fucking you up uh, because they're just taking all the same shit that the food industry is using and using it to sell their shit, and that shit doesn't work. But there's people like yourself who can make things make sense for people and actually give you things that work that are, are not hard to understand, but they're very, very valuable. Um, so yeah, man, I, I love it. I'm I'm pumped to see uh, see your show, listen to the show, and uh, be happy to be a guest. That'd be fucking awesome. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Cool, man. Well, hey, I, I know you're busy, so I'll let you run. Thanks again for jumping on, man. I I appreciate it, dude. Of course, dude. It was great to talk to you. Yep. Talk to you soon.